So a lot of it begins with, as we've been uncovering here, the understanding of, of what values are. And uh, I was saying a value could be something like, um, well, I'm sorry, it wasn't kindness. So I said it was uh, kindness could be a value. Um, a tolerance be a way of, of, of explaining what you're saying. Another value would be tolerance. And these are values that. And love in what sense? You mean by by love? Do you mean like a romantic love? You mean like love between friends? Do you mean yeah. love well, that? Between family and romantic. Love. Okay, so <clears throat> when I say love, like um, we will say it's familial. Um, yeah, I may even say it's, it's like a, it's an action. It's not just a sentiment, but it's a thing that a person does. In other words, you show love. Yeah, not just to feel it, but to show it in some way. Okay. <clears throat> so these values of kindness, tolerance, love, uh, these are things that a lot of people will say that, that they value. Uh, part of the difficulty, is, as we've talked about, is that a lot of us don't really think about our values or specifically why we have them. And that becomes problematic because if you don't know why you've got something, it becomes pretty easy to, to dismiss it. Because, well, first off, it's not, really, it's not really yours. It's kind of like with cliches. Um, when people talk in cliches, people say things like, oh, one of my favorite ones, uh, it is what it is. That's kind of like a way of trying to end a conversation without actually ever saying anything. It's a completely meaningless statement. Well, you know, it, it is what it is. Therefore, what? Um, you'll hear people say things like, um, love is blind. Or something like that. <clears throat> the point is that when we use cliches, we're using cliches because specifically they're not our own thoughts. We don't know how to express the thing that we're expressing. So we're going to kind of uh, shape a thought almost to fit into a cliche rather than the other way around. And then we present it. And it's, uh, it's safe. By the way, when I, when, I, when I grade like freshman composition papers over at the college, you get a lot of that kind of stuff. A lot of people writing cliches. I think they learn it from, from AP classes or something. And then, the, but it, it's a safe thing for them to do because then they present that idea, and then if I circle it and say, "This is trash," and you know it, it isn't a, a slight against them as a person because hey, it wasn't my idea. So it's a safe way of, of presenting ideas. Um, it's also a safe way of presenting ideas because it's a cliche. People who write in them tend to think, "Well, we all just kind of take for granted that it's true." Um, but cliches aren't necessarily true. They're largely true, depending on the context, of course. That's why they. They've survived for so long, and they, they express something very well that a lot of people would have difficulty expressing. The problem is that we rely on them, and then because we rely on them, we never really explore the idea ourselves. So, for example, <coughs> excuse me. When I was um, I was badgering Nico about about explaining what he means by love, because you'll hear this kind of stuff all the time. Like, hey, man, we have to have love. But in what I mean, we all have to be romantically attached to each other. That's kind of weird. No, no, that's not what I mean. But what do you mean? Well, you know, love. Well, th that isn't, isn't love romantic attachment. No, no, no. I mean it in a different way. And so it's trying to tease out in our heads what it is that we mean. If some of you remember from a, a little bit ago, I talked about there being different forms of love. You're looking at like the Greek love, and the last one, which is the, probably the, the strongest love. <clears throat> and it's action based, it's called agape. And agape is something that you do because you have a duty to do it. You don't do it because you have an emotional attachment to somebody. It's not emotional, it's duty based, it's a verb, it's an action that you do. So you show love towards people. Even if you don't have a sentimental attachment to them, you, you show them this thing put through this action of love. Does this make sense? I feel like it made sense into that last statement that I made. So it's an action that you do to, to demonstrate a, a type of a duty that we have towards people. 
Um, I mean, if, you, if any of you guys listen to reggae, oh shit, I'm sorry if you do, because reggae sucks. But if you do listen to reggae, unfortunately, you know that song One Love? You know, we just get together. Well, what does he mean? Does he mean like romantic love? No, he means something else. And it's a thing that intuitively, maybe, we can start to, to tease out. But there's a problem when we can say that we intuitively know something, but then we can't explain it. That means we don't really actually know what it is. So um, it's important for us to know that because then what happens is you come across a person, you get angry with them, and you start to question whether or not you love them. And it doesn't have to just be you know, uh, someone that you know. It could be just a person you come across on the trolley. Well, wh why would you love someone who you come across on the trolley? Well, I don't know. If you're saying that love is a value that we have, well, then wouldn't you just love everybody in that sense? Again, yeah, not in the romantic sense, but maybe in the agape sense? Or maybe in the familial sense? There again? I don't know. And that really is what it is. I don't know. <laughs> if, if it's your idea. And so when we start talking in cliches, we start to realize, huh, I really don't know what it is that I'm, I'm presenting or talking about. Because it's being present because it's not really our thought. Or somebody else's thought. So anyway, um, when you look at something like, like a, a value like kindness, and I wonder if kindness for a lot of people has, has an asterisk next to it. Oh, I'm, I'm kind to people, asterisk, who are kind to me. So if they're kind to me, I'll be kind to them. Well, then is kindness really your value? Or is your value something that's more akin to like reciprocity? I, I, I will give you what you give back to me. And maybe that's how the world should work for some people. You know, I, I give you kindness, you give me kindness. If you don't give me kindness back, then you don't get kindness from me. So again, maybe your value isn't really like this at all. Maybe it's something more akin to reciprocity. Um, I'll, I'll give back what I get. But then, interestingly enough, when someone's not kind to you, then, then it shouldn't bother you. Because they just don't, because you don't really have that value yourself. Maybe you'll be upset if someone isn't, isn't reciprocal to you. Fine, you know, you'll get what you give. And that's fine. But what this also does, though, is it sets you up for a life of, of true understanding. And one with a lot less frustration in it. Because if this is what you're always preaching and you don't get this, then you, you, can, you can understand that well, then the world's a terrible place. Oh, of course the world's a terrible place because it doesn't conform to your values, you narcissist. But if you really do believe that, then maybe this is what you're really after. And if this is the case, then you can go, oh my god, the world's terrible. Oh, I know. No, actually, no. Most people will give you what you get. All right. Okay, never mind. The world's fine. In other words, this will, this will shape and shape how you perceive the world. Remember, none of us sees the world the way that, that it really is. We all see the world the ways that, that we really are. And so what that tells you is something really, really important. That tells you that most of the world, then, is in perception. Now, I'll say that again. Most of the world, then, is in perception. So what that means is that since, since, the, since that's outside of you, but your perceptions are inside of you, how can you make the world a better place? Well, you change your perceptions. You actively go about changing your perceptions so that you see things differently, which you can force yourself to do. And then if you start to see things differently, so for example, um, one example I use is like with road rage. People get really furious when someone cuts them off in traffic. Like, oh my God, you cut me off. Okay, sure, they cut you off. Or they were, you know, they, they made a, they, they, they planned badly. And they, or, or actually, better yet, they didn't see your car. They didn't cut you off. They have no idea who you are. If you look over and you see the person and, they, and you turn out you do know them as someone that you don't like, well then yeah, maybe they cut you off. But more likely, they cut your car off. They didn't think of you as a person. They, they thought nothing about the world outside of themselves. They only thought about, oh man, I need to be in this lane. Or they're mindlessly driving down the street and they just didn't realize that you were even there. In any of these cases, it's not a personal slight against you. Instead, it's, it's, a, it, it says it's, it's more about their character than it is about yours. And I shouldn't say even character. That's a bad way of phrasing it, too. It's more about how they're operating in the world rather than how you are. And if that's the case, then you understand well, there's no reason to be upset. You can be angry with them, sure, but that's like trying to chew bubblegum to solve an algebra equation. It's not going to do anything. It won't be effective. It's only going to frustrate you more. 
So then because you're angry about how you got cut off, <sighs> all this stress, these people who just can't drive, true. But how many cars do you, how many, if, you're, if you're driving to, to school or to work, how many cars do you come across? 100, 200, 300? I mean, genuinely, you know, if you park cars too, why not? Cars that you're driving past on the street, you come across hundreds of cars. One guy cuts you off, that's what, 0.25% of all drivers? So that's a pretty good number. So maybe things aren't as bad as you, as you, as you would you know, initially kind of project out into the world. You can change your perception and realize, he didn't cut me off, he made a mistake. It isn't like I've never made a mistake before. I've, you know, have, have I cut people off before? Yeah, I do. And what do I normally do? I usually give the wave. And I've done that like, ah, shoot, I'm sorry. And I've still had people kind of swerve around me and, and yell at me. It's like, well, what are you going to do? <coughs> it's funny. You know, especially the, the funny ones are the ones who will go around you and then they'll honk as they go past you. They won't honk when they're behind you, but they'll honk when they're safely in, in a position where they can get away from you. That's a person who just wants to vent. Okay, no problem, vent. And it isn't venting at me, it's venting at the driver of this particular car. So by changing your perception, you can lower your frustration level as a driver, you can lower your stress, and you're probably going to behave differently because you're not angry and stressed out. In other words, you're not going to take that out on somebody else, especially if things pile up during the day. Um, so, you're, so half of the world is in perceptions, half of it's in reality, at least in terms of how we function within it. So um, maybe if you expect kindness, you can be disappointed from it. That might be your value also, by the way. And if that's your value, then it doesn't matter what other people do. You're kind to people. What if they're not kind to you? Whatever. That's not their value. That's my value. And that's something that I think is important, and therefore I'm going to do it. Because I think that by being kind, we make the world a better place. And just because, you know, somebody else isn't kind, that's, again, that's on them. That they're going to have to live in the hell that they're creating. Because people who are unkind tend to surround themselves with people who are also unkind. And it's, a, it's an angry, backstabbing, untrusting lot, usually, of angry people. It's a little stew of, of, of unhappy people, stressed out people. So they're going to have to pay for that little hell in their own, that, that, that hell of their own creation. Fine. That doesn't mean that you have to live in the hell of their creation. And then therefore, if that's your value, it doesn't matter if someone's mean to you, or nice to you, or whatever. It's just something that you do. Same, um, so having said that, hatred is a feeling which leads to the extinction of values. So when you start to hate people, all of these things go out the window. As Kai was saying, if you hate someone of a different political persuasion, then if you have a, a view, let's say, of tolerance, like, well, I think we should be tolerant of all views. Okay, what about if someone disagrees with you? Shut up, Nazi! Oh, you know, let's see if we can get this person fired. Well, maybe tolerance isn't really your view. Maybe your value is really power. It has nothing to do with tolerance. Maybe you've globbed on to an ideology that, you, that somehow gives you some level of social power over people. And that's what you're really after. You want to be able to, to be powerful and in control. And you'll typically find that kind of thing from especially weak people. In other words, people who have found themselves unable to, to thrive, and maybe even barely survive in a society. They'll glob together and they'll, and they'll, they'll, they'll kind of enforce their values on other people. Not necessarily because the world, it makes the world a better place. They may think that it does. And then there's no discounting. I'm not saying that it's just completely nefarious. They most likely do think the world is made better by their values. Or at least by the values that they espouse. Like, for example, tolerance. So we should be tolerant of all views. Should we? Yes. Okay, what about, um, what about if we have actual Nazis? Like real ones. Not like, I disagree with you, Nazis. But actual real ones. Do you tolerate their view? Well, not that view. Why not? Well, because, you know, whatever comes in the because afterwards, I promise you, you can now stuff, start to stuff all kinds of other things into there. It doesn't just have to be about if someone's a Nazi. It can be if someone who approximates that. If someone, you can start to go, you can start to, to really populate that list. And what that tells you is that that's not really your, your value. And are you going to be kind towards those people as well? Of course, probably not. So therefore, that tells you that kindness is not one of your values. So now what that starts, and then you certainly therefore don't love the people. You're not behaving with love towards them. So then maybe what you're really after 
is power. Maybe that's the thing that really drives you. Maybe that's your real value. And if that's the case, fine. Well, my goodness, stop pretending to be these things because you're inauthentic at that point. It's, you're not a real person. You're an avatar. A big part of, of living is to be able to, to be courageous. To be courageous with your values. What I mean by that is courage is rooted in the very structure of existence. Let me say that again. Courage is rooted in the very structure of, of existence. And that's the courage to, 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 to live authentically, to actually be yourself. Uh, the courage to seek truth. And the courage to actually express truth. So it's the courage to, to live authentically. It's the courage to, um, to seek truth and then to express truth once you find it. Because those are the things that constitute you as a human being. When you don't have the courage to do those things, you therefore don't have the courage to live. Because now what you're going to do is you're going to deny yourself the, the, the living authentically because of a fear of whatever, can, can, you know, whatever bad can happen to you in, in, our, in our minds. And then if you, have, if you lack the courage to, to live authentically, well then you've already, kind of ex you've already seemed to have, to have expressed that you lack the courage to seek truth. Because that's, I mean, truth and authenticity, they, they, they walk together like, like beans and cornbread. And then if you can't seek the truth, if you don't have the courage for that, then you absolutely certainly don't have the courage to express truth. Because expressing truth, that's the thing that a lot of people think of as being dangerous. That's the person who, who will espouse their value, even when the mob is against them, and, and exercising their power against you. In other words, if you don't have the, the, the courage to be authentic with yourself and tell the truth to yourself, and to express the truth to yourself, then you certainly are not going to have it to express to everybody else. And so what that means is that, let me see if I can explain this, you, the actual you, the psychical you, the thing that makes up the real you, not your body, but the real you, that has thoughts and opinions and emotions and experiences and all of these things, that person, when they feel that when they don't have the courage to express themselves, that means that that person who you are cannot live in the world. I'll say that again. That person who you are, if you lack the courage to, to seek those things, authenticity, truth, and expression of truth, you cannot live, therefore, in the world. That person has to live somewhere else in your mind and never gets expressed. And that means that that person is never born. Or certainly, at the very least, that person who you are dies because of the lack of courage. So courage itself, as I said, is rooted in the very structure of being, the very structure of existence, because you can't exist without courage. And I hope that makes sense. It's a complicated idea, but I hope it makes sense. So the courage to, to do those things is the courage to be. It's the, it's the courage to exist. If, a, if kindness is your value, the, the courage to express kindness, no matter what response you get, no matter what response you get, that's the courage to exist. If the courage to, to have tolerance towards views. If you lack the courage to do that, and a lot of people are, are afraid of this because they understand that if somebody else brings a view that challenges ours, it, it, it can destroy our view, which then destroys part of us. That's our real fear. It's really a fear. This is why people will try to stop people from talking. Because they know that, that, that what they're saying, that they themselves are saying, can be destroyed by what somebody else is saying. This is why we try to limit speech. So if you lack the courage to actually exercise tolerance, then you lack the courage to exist in the world. And my goodness, if you lack the courage for it to, to love, then you can't exist in the world with that, as, as that person, as that personality. And some people will say that that's the very essence of, 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 of what it is to, to, to be human. And so, hatred is the thing that, strangely enough, can destroy all of those. <laughs> So maybe we should be careful with it. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques?